Hey guys, it's Ingo Messi Domer again and welcome back to my channel. So first of all, thank you very much for joining the channel. I really appreciate your time. I also wanted to reach out to you guys who haven't subscribed yet to subscribe because that's really gonna help me in improving and growing this amazing community. I also wanted to tell you that I'm gonna be continuing the procedural generation algorithm that I started on previous videos. We went through creating a cube as a mesh. We also created a qua. And then in this video, I want to focus on refactoring that code and then creating a grid system that is gonna allow us to expand it and also hopefully create a city at some point that is completely procedurally generated. I also wanted to tell you that if you want the source code for this video, go ahead and check it out in Patreon where I'm basically gonna be posting it today. And then the following week is gonna be available for the public. So let's go into Unity and start working on it. All right guys, so let me show you what I have going on in the Unity scene. So right now I'm showing you the grid system that I that I created and, he, and I'm trying to give it a look of a city. So you can see that, you know, some buildings are higher than others. I also have different colors and shades assigned to them. And all of this is all created by specifying parameters in a grid. So if I go into the grid that you can see under the hierarchy, I can now specify the width, the height, the, the shape width. So this width and height is for the grid. The shape, width, height, and depth is for the shape individual objects. Also the max random height determines what the maximum height is gonna be. The random seed allows me to change the generation of the procedural city. So what I can do now is one thing that I noticed that this is taking a little bit longer than I than I imagined, and it's because I'm I haven't applied any optimization to this algorithm. At some point in time, we're gonna be using the job system for Unity. For now, we're just gonna keep it simple. So let me go down to say, you know, 10 and 10. So if I do 10 and 10 and I change the seed, you can see that I'm now generating different procedural shapes. And in fact, if we go, let's go closer so you can see how this works. So I'm in the same view, I don't have any light applied to it so you can see everything better. So if I change the random seed, everything is randomly getting generated. If I change, let's say that I wanted to change the height, I wanna to go to from three to a five, and then change the seed, you can see that the height is also changing. If we go ahead and let's say that I want the, the width to be maybe double, I can say two. You can see that those are now looking different, and, and this is really powerful. It might just look like simple cubes and rectangles, but at some point, this is gonna look a lot better. We're gonna be applying UVs, textures, and this is the fundamentals of creating a procedural city. So the other thing that I can show you, let me show you the, the depth as well. So if I change the depth, that also changes the depth of the of this grid. So another thing that is cool is if I want to, you know, for let's say that I wanted to go, you know, to 20 instead of 50, or maybe I wanted to go, let's do something cool. Let's do two in height of 20 and I hit, and I hit play and just hit play until it builds to, there we go. And we can go. So what's cool about this is I can now create, let's say that I wanted to go, I didn't want to go as high. So I'm gonna change the max height to be one and then just regenerate it. And you can see that we're now getting, you know, different shapes just with a simple grid system that it allow us to modify what we, you know, what the outcome is gonna be. Say that I wanted to say, I wanted to go smaller, maybe 0.5 and I update the system. So it looks like the, the minimum, and this is something that I'm gonna show you in the in the source code, the minimum I have it set to one. We can make it lower if we wanted to. Let's go ahead and, and go bigger. Let's do a six and see what we get. So we get a much taller, you know, much taller grid. If I go and say, well, you know what I want to, I only wanna see one, one row and I can do that. And now you have a platform. So this can be used for anything. If you want to create a platform game, if you want to create, you know, what I'm trying to do, which is a city, or if you want to use it for something else, I think this is this, this is where the flexibility comes in handy when you're doing procedural generation. So you can see that I can now do that. So let's say that I want to go, I want to go really small on the height, but maybe the depth is going to be five. I can go and, you know, make a flat surface. And now it's another platform where your character can can walk on. And if I wanna change, let's say that I wanna go, let's change the math high to be two. Now you can see, you know, you can get little bumps on the road, 
where the character you know it's gonna have to it's gonna have to jump we can so I'm gonna be adding a lot more functionality right now I have width height shape width the shape the height the shape depth the max random height the seed the shape tab that I that I want to use for these procedural generation I, I also have a quad I'm gonna be adding more different shapes as I build more meshes into this algorithm also the shader name because these are generated uh, in procedurally and if you look at the shader that I'm using is a lightweight render pipeline the reason why I included this is because you might not want to use LWRP you may want to use HDRP or you might want to use just a regular rendering pipeline and if that's the case you can specify the shader that you want to apply to this randomly and then this is something that I'm also working on which is the texture right now I have it commented out in the code because I don't have it just right but I'm gonna do it in a future video where I'll show you how to apply UVs and textures procedurally okay so let's go into so now that I show you that let me go ahead and I'm gonna go ahead and undo everything that I did so that we have the CD that we had to start with we just go ahead and hit play and another thing that is important to remember is I'm gonna be putting this in source control so it's gonna be available in GitHub and I'm gonna be posting this today via via Patreon with for early access patrons if you're interested and you want to donate go ahead and do so because that's really gonna help me in improving the community and building more more videos like this so let me show you let me show you the source code now that we went through the demo so in the previous videos I had everything basically added to one big class and it wasn't very object oriented basically focused so I try to refactor everything and make it as you know as good as I, I can make it right now in knowing that I'm gonna be adding functionality to this so so this is basically what I have right now I have an abstract class for the shape I also have an enum so if we go and look at that enum and let me just go ahead and place it on the right side so you can see what the enum looks like so the enum just specify what type of shapes we're gonna be generating procedurally like I said I only have cube and quads so we're gonna be adding more I also have the flow the width of the grid I also have the height of the grid and the depth of the grid so the other thing that I also have is the mesh so mesh generate so the mesh generate is a uh, it's, uh, it's also a signature most of these ones are our signature except these ones because they're properties but the reason why I make this one more generic is because I want to be able to call these from you know from the cube generation class or from the quad generation class because I may want to do different things so that this is the abstract class for the shape if we go back into the cube I show you this class already in I didn't show you the class but I show you some of the implementation what I did is I I refactor it so now cube inherits from shape and I'm basically overriding the the generate method in this in this case and the first thing that I do on and what I'm gonna be doing on most of these tiles is I'm gonna be setting the shape type that they are so I know that this is a cube so I set that to a cube I also generate a new mesh and I apply all the vertices the triangles the normals and then at some point I'm gonna be doing the UVs so this is like I said the same video the same code that I had previously all I did is just put it into a new method so this part I'm gonna be explaining it in the next video where I'm gonna be applying the texture so for now just it's basically not getting even set it's, get, it's going through this code but I'm not setting the UVs because it doesn't work just right and, and I'm doing everything else here is you know the same as the previous video so if you didn't watch the previous video Go ahead and, and look at it so that you understand how I'm creating this cube. The quad, the same thing. All the code is the same except I'm just saying, you know, shape types that quad, and that's the shape type that I assign, and then everything else is the same. So that is the quad and the cube. So they both inherit from from shape. And let's look at some other things. So I also did some refactoring on the procedural shapes class. This was the class that I showed you on the previous three scenes and the things that I change here are that I now call I now call the generate method so there is a global kind of a, a main generate method for all the things that I'm creating in this class and now that I'm now that I have the generate in a basically in a single in a single class in an abstract class 
I am, and I'm also inheriting quad and cube. Now I can do, you know, I can say, okay, I'm going to generate a mesh, and this is going to be my variable name. It's going to be of type quad, and then I'm going to call the generate method. So the cool thing about this is I can say it's more explicit. I can tell it what type of shape I want to generate and what method I want to call. So it's really easy to use if you want to create shapes anywhere in your, basically anywhere in your code. And that's how I started. I started by refactoring those two classes and then refactoring the procedural shapes and then realizing that I could use that for more. And that's when I started to use the, to create the grid. So now that you look at these, this is, you know, fairly simple and, and it, it's basically the previous code that I, that I had, it's just refactor. So now let's look at something new that I, that I created. And let me look at, let me just pull the grid. So the grid system is the one that does most of the work specifically for this scene. And I'm going to be adding a lot more code, but for now, let me just go through and, and explain to you how it works. So the first thing that I do is I create a width. So the width is going to be the width of the grid. And I show you that by, by showing you how it looks on the inspector. I also specify a previous width. The reason why I did this is because I want to track if there are changes. If there are changes on the width, I want to regenerate the grid. I also have one for the height and the same pattern there. I also have uh, basically a double array. So this array is just to store, you know, the rows and the columns. That's what I'm doing. The brackets, comma, and then brackets just to create a grid. And let me just say that again, that's a multidimensional array. I, I forgot the name, but by doing the comma, it allows you to specify basically a multidimensional array with, like I said, a rows and column. Then I also have the sizes of the shapes that I'm going to be creating. And these ones are by default, I set them to two. I also have the max random height that I show you in the inspector. The random C is very important because that's going to allow me to change the procedural generation and basically initialize the seed. And then I store the previous seed so that I know there are changes. The other thing that I do here is I also have an enum for the shape type because I want the grid to be flexible and allow me to create a grid of, of quads or a grid of cubes for now. And then, like I said before, I also have the shader name that I'm specifying when I'm creating the material. And this is just early, basically the code that I'm going to be using to apply texture. So for now, just ignore that. We're not going to be looking into that. So the first thing that I do in this algorithm, I, I initialize the previous width to the width, previous height to the height. I initialize the seed. So this is going to be the number that I set in the inspector. The same thing with these two. And then I create a new, basically a new multidimensional array. I set the initial values. So the value of this array is going to be the height and the width of the grid. So, so that we can create a grid system. And then right after that, I build the grid based on the parameters that the level designer or you specify in the inspector. Once I, once I do this, I basically have two for loops one that goes over the rows. So that's what I'm saying, row equals zero, row less than height, and then row plus plus. Then once I know the value of the row, which is gonna be zero, let's say that we're going through the first iteration, I also get the value of columns. So the way that this works is the first thing that I do is I look at, of course, I create a cell, and then I look at the value of row, which is in this iteration is gonna be zero, column zero. So this is gonna be the first cell. So if the first cell is null, and the reason why I, create, I check for null is because these might be already be set and I want to be able to clear the grid. And, you know, if I make a change, I want to rebuild the grid. So that's what the if statement is for. So the first thing that I do is I check to see, okay, is that null? If it is null, I create a new game object and I assign the name of row. And this is using a string interpolation. I have the dollar symbol at the beginning and then I can pass in parameters. So the first row is going to be zero. Second row is, is the first column is going to be zero. So that is going to be the name of that cell. Then I assign the cell to the parent so that everything is under that grid game object. So it's basically going to be, everything is going to be behind under this grid game object. So if I created that, we'll go through the else in just a minute. So just, just believe that this is going to be null and that we're creating the first cell. So. I create the first cell, I create the first game object, I assign it to the parent, 
and then I assign the grid value a position 0, 0, and then I assign the cell. So the next thing that I do, I position the cell based on the shape width. I multiply it by the row. So at the beginning, this is going to be, you know, whatever the value is for the shape width. Let's say that we set it to 50. And let's say that we are on row 0. So it's going to be 0. It's going to place that, that cell at the first position. And then I get the shape height, which is going to be, let's say that we have it set to, to 50 or we have it set to 0. If it was 0, it's going to stay flat on Y. And then I randomly generate a number from 1 to the max random height. So if this is 0, this whole thing is going to be 0, so it's going to be flat. If this is, let's say that we get a number of 3 and this was 50, so that will be, that's why you, you saw the, the, the platforms that I created and they, were, they had a little bump where the Y value of each one of those rectangles was a little bit higher, and that this is what's, what's doing that. Then let's say that the shape depth was set to 50 as well, and column 0, so that will be set to 0 as well. So that's when you'll get, you know, a line looking, a line looking cell. So the next thing that I do is I get the mesh filter component, I also get the renderer component, and then I assign the mesh filter, that mesh, to the new cube that I'm creating procedurally. So Again, I'm going back to the procedural shapes and remember the new syntax that I use. I create a new cube. This cube is part of the, it's inheriting from the shape so I can specify the width, the height, the depth and then call the generate method on it. So I made this really straightforward so that you could call generate on any new type of shapes. So the next thing that I do, I apply a random material and I'll show you the extension that I created for this. So basically you pass in the shader name and then the cell name, and it creates a random material for you. Let me show you how that looks when I hit play. So if I hit play and we look at one of the cells, you'll see that I have a material that is randomly generated, and the name is gonna be the name of the cell, the row index, the column index, underscore material, and also it has a lightweight render pipeline shader. And that's what I'm doing here. I'm basically passing the shader name and then the name of the cell. And that's why we're getting that name on the material. Then a couple of things that you need to do before you assign, you assign a color to the material. So you need to enable keywords. And in this case, I'm enabling this property. The reason why I do that is because I'm applying a texture procedurally. You don't have to do that in this version of the code. I'm just, I did that because I needed to pass in the, the texture. And it doesn't look right because that's not completed so just ignore these two things and let me show you how these apply random material works so i'm going to go into my extensions i created an extension method for that because i knew i was going to use that quite a bit and let me just focus on this so this is that exact same method that i that i used in the previous video i i'm creating a mesh render extensions is a static and then I'm saying this mesh render, and this is what the extension, the syntax of, of an extension is, which is why I can say on the render, on the mesh render variable, I can say apply random material. So extension methods are really cool. I, I really enjoy using them. And then let me just go ahead and pause the, just click play to, to stop the game. Looks like it's slowing down. All right, so, so that's the extension. I take in the shader name, the game object name, and then I assign the material to the render. So this is this didn't change, and I also moved the the get random color method to the static class. All right, let's go back and close this. All right, and then so that's basically what the what the grid is doing. It's just you know creating creating a grid. Oh, and let me show you the other the other iteration. Let's say that I made a change to the width, and the grid was already created. So in that case, if I look through here, I would say I would find out that grid that grid row column it's not going to be null, which is why I'm calling destroy in media. So I'm destroying the game object that I previously assigned, which is going to be a cell. Then I assign it a new game object, and then I basically add a reference to the new cell, and I reassign the this new cell to be a child of the grid. So that's what you're seeing here, and this allows me to destroy a game object and let's say that I have a new width and height on the shape then we can basically insert a new shape all right so that's basically the build grid and let me go back down now to changes so in every time I make a change to to one of these properties let's say that I change the previous seed the random seed value so 
the way that I detect changes, and this might not be the, the most you know optimal way, I'm gonna be changing this in the future, but for now, this is how it works. I check that the random seed does not equal the previous seed, and then if that is true, then I know there was a change. I build the grid again, and I set, I set previous equal random. And then I do the same thing with other properties such as a previous, such as width, and I check previous width and also height and I change and I check previous height. I could add the other properties that I added on the top, like shape, width, you know, and so on. But for now I think this works. One thing to keep in mind that I, I am doing every time I change the, the previous width, since I'm only changing, in this case I'm only changing the seed. I don't really need to change the, the width of the shape or regenerate the shape. So that's what I'm not clearing the I'm not calling clear all in this case because I don't need to create new shapes. But in this case, I do need to create new shapes because I'm getting new, basically a new height and a new width. So I call this clear, clear all. And this clear all basically has two for loops where I go through the previous height and the previous width to destroy all the different game objects that I already put in the grid. And then the next thing that I do is I set the previous, basically the previous width to be to have the new width the previous height to have the new height. And then I create a new grid for the, basically for the system. So that's how that that's how that works. And I could also add in here, build grid after the fact, but I like to change the seed and that's why I'm not rebuilding the grid in here. I'm only, you know, I'm only setting it. And then you as a level designer or as a creator will need to change the seed in order to regenerate the, the grid. So that's basically, I know that that was a lot of information and one thing to mention as well is I'm using a lot of minimums and height. You're more than welcome to change this to a higher number, to a lower number, but remember that I'm gonna be putting this in source control and if you want to create a pull request to a functionality to this, I'm more than happy to, to review it and then accept it if it makes sense to, you know, if it's gonna work well with the, with the stuff that I wanna do for the future. So that's everything that I wanted to show you guys. Thank you. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching this video. I really appreciate your time. I also wanted to invite you to check out gamedev.net because they have amazing resources and tutorials for game developers. And also find me in Patreon where I'm basically posting information about what I'm doing behind the scenes. Also early access to source code. Thank you very much, guys.